In this episode, with great honor, I bring you one of the legends of MC culture. Today we sit down with Phil Aguilar, the chief, the outlaw of the outlaws. And you're gonna understand why when you watch this video. This man has done it all from broke to millionaire, going broke and then becoming a millionaire again. We get into it on this episode of Demons Row TV. And oh yeah, we ghosting, baby. Shout to the ghosts and the ghost sets. Welcome to Demons Row TV, the holy grail of MC culture, where we cover everything motorcycle and motorcycle club involved. I'm Sos the Ghost. I'm your host for the evening. Big shout to my brother Mike Ball for making the call to make this historic interview go down. This is the full interview with the chief, Phil Aguilar. No more delay. Let's get into it. I what are my dream interviews and believe it or not it's you and hulk hogan two people that wow. are very different but <laughs> yeah a lot of people don't know about me my upbringing in the church and how i was raised and when i heard your story i was just i fell in love and i want the whole world to know your story because i think it's an important story that just because you believe in god doesn't mean you're a pushover doesn't mean you're weak so tell, tell us about where you came from and how it all started. How does a Pastor Phil become a Pastor Phil? Like, what is, the, what is the roots? Like, what kind of family did you come up in? Well, I was born and raised in beautiful Anaheim, California, before Disneyland was around. So I'm a wow. last of the Mohicans. I was born in 1947. So I've been wow. around for a long time, just turned 75 wonderful years wow. old. So I've seen a whole lot in uh, daily, uh, you know, wake up early and I've been living life. But I started out, like I said, in a beautiful little family. We used to watch a TV show when I was a kid called Father Knows Best. And on TV, you watch this beautiful, happy, wonderful family. And I was at a home with six kids, mom and a dad, and it all seemed like it was going good. I was young, but then, uh, what I saw on TV and what I saw happen in my own home wasn't the same. In my own home, so my dad grabbed my mom by the hair, beating her head against the wall, wow. screaming, cursing. And so, uh, you know, as a young kid, I'm trying to, how do you process that? So I did what so many people do, walked down the end of the street and saw some of the older fellas and uh, told them a little bit of my problem at home, you know, the pain I was going through. And of course, everybody has a remedy. They said, smoke this, drink this. And so at uh, 12 years old, you know, just started doing drugs right there. Wow, dang And uh, mad at the world, mad at the world. Yeah. And uh, I'm the oldest of six kids, and I'm no example. So then the next blow happens when my dad leaves the house. What age around? 12 years old. Wow, yeah. okay. My dad leaves the house, so now I'm in charge. I'm the man of the house. My mom goes to work. She worked making uh, sandwiches for a coffee truck. So just menial labor, trying to pay the bills there. My dad was out with this other woman, took off and started raising another family. So I was just winging it on my own, like so many young people are nowadays when we see that when people are incarcerated or whatever it might be, it's always single parent families for sure. Yeah. Or usually the odds are you're gonna be dealing with some kind of drug or alcohol or violence or institutional problems. So yeah. there I was a 12 year old just pissed off at life, mad at the world, you know, I didn't know God, I was blaming God, everybody. So as the years went by, it just started progressing, you know, from smoking marijuana, you know, to taking red pills, taking methamphetamine pills, drinking a lot, just partying, not caring anything about school. And then uh, I can remember when I was about 13 years old, I saw a bunch of guys jump a guy. And I go, oh man, you know, normally you'd see that and think that's what a terrible thing. But for me inside, that registered like, yeah, that's the kind of life I want, you know? Wow. Beating on people's ass. Yeah. You know, I thought that was great. Then about 14 years old, uh, I wanted something and my mom didn't buy it. I said, well, I'll go steal it. So I went out there and stole some stuff. Next thing you know, I'm locked up. The whole neighborhood's watching the police come to get me. They put handcuffs on me. 
And you can tell when you like the feeling of handcuffs that there's something real sick within you, but yeah. I didn't notice that. All I know is I felt like somebody. I wanted to be something in this world. I wanted somebody to care. Dad was gone. You know, I felt that God had deserted me. And my mom, she was just working. She didn't know what to do. So here I am, a juvenile hall, in and out, in and out. But then I had the saving grace thinking at uh, 15 years old, I thought I, I, I found love, my first puppy love. And it was a girl from the other side of the trash because I was the darkest kid in town. Yeah. Where I'm from, like I says, you know, you just didn't go out with the white girls, simple as that. Oh, wow. And so I'd sneak out and uh, this redheaded cheerleader from Anaheim High School where I <laughs> went to school, she says, hey, I babysit for my brother on Friday nights, come on over. So I go over there, pick up some booze and little drugs, go over there to see her. And so we fall in this puppy love. And a lot of people, I tell them, I deal with drug addicts of every kind of drug, but the love drug, that's the most dangerous one I've ever yeah. dealt with anybody. And because uh, uh, I don't know if you ever had a broken heart before, but yeah. uh, most people in some way, shape or form have. So here I am going out with this little girl, Annie, beautiful little redhead. And I thought life was great again. See, we find something good, but most of us are always looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah. So I thought I found it. I thought this was it. I'm all good now. I got me a woman, everything like that. And I'm 15 years old. I can't even drive a car yet. Yeah. But Annie, uh, one day, she burns me with my best friend, Max. I see her riding down the street with him in his car. And I didn't know the Bible verse at the time, but where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, my treasure was sitting next to my so-called best friend, riding down the street. And at uh, 15 years old, I said, F the world. Man, I don't care. I will never trust another woman again. And so I just had to forget about chipping the shoulder, man. I had a bad attitude towards everything in life. And it, went, it got, just got worse, you know, different drugs, everything like that. 17 years old, man, I was out of my mind on drugs one night. So I decided I'm going to go to see God. I remember hearing that I got baptized when I was a baby at a Catholic church downtown Anaheim. Yeah. So that night, about midnight, when I'm just hurting, I'm in pain, I go to this church to go see God. I go to open the front door of the church, and guess what? God wasn't it's there. It's locked. I go, man, I'm madder at God than ever. Now, where are you at? You know, because I thought wow. he lived in that church, so I'm just it's progressively getting worse. And it just went over and over. Tried to stop it many different ways, but drug after drug after drug. And then I remember growing up in a little uh, gang neighborhood where my relatives, everybody like that, were heroin addicts. And we knew that you could do any drug, but never do that. That's for losers. That's for haters. They'll steal from their mom, grandma. They'll just, they don't care about anybody but themselves. Yeah. But here I am, like I says, now I'm in my 20s. I'm a cocaine dealer, smuggler, doing all that kind of stuff. And then I meet this lady, beautiful lady. Once again, my weakness, beautiful lady, she yeah. comes and goes, hey, uh, hey, hey, Phil, how about uh, let's do a little heroin? And I go, never, I would never do that. Wow. And then she kind of asked that other time again, you know, how a girl maybe can ask. And I got weak in my knees. The next thing you know, I'm putting my arm out and uh, she's shooting me up with some heroin. And man, then from there, it just went downhill as quick as possible. I spent the next number of years, you know, and I was always riding a Harley at that time, riding a bike at that time, okay. throwing partying and doing all that kind of stuff. And I even had a guy named Fat Ray from the San Diego chapter of the Hells Angels. Uh, he knew a bunch of my brothers and stuff like that, so he wanted to help me get off the heroin. He took me to a USA run in Omaha, Nebraska, and just to try to help me dry out from the heroin because I'd become a hope to die dope fiend. You know, in the spoon before noon, just out of my mind, shooting heroin every day, and sure enough, stealing from my mom, my sisters, my brothers. Never Was ever. it strange for you to get help from a hell's angel at that time? Because I always hear that out here, there's like the big racial barrier. So was that like an outlier that you got that certain kind of love from that, from that group? You know, this guy, like a fat Ray Pilts, and uh, he was kind of a darker skin, you know, oh. angle. But uh, no, they, they gave me good love there. You know, I, I don't know if it was just because it was me. Yeah. But they treated me like gold, yeah. helped me out, let me in on a run that's a private run for their group. Wow. 
and I spent three days at a party over there, and they really did try to help me out. Yeah. You know, and I, I thought it was kind of strange that they even cared what drug you took, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because they were outlaws, but uh, they really did help me out, and uh, but uh, that wasn't going. I was just a knucklehead, hard head, and then finally, like I says, when I uh, hit uh, just about 30 years old, um, I was with my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, but um, I sold everything that she owned, stole wow. it, sold everything that she owned, and uh, I ended up doing a drug deal where uh, I burnt these people for a big, large amount of drugs, big number, you know, and um, next thing you know is we're partying up, I'm going crazy, and in beautiful downtown Anaheim, this hope to die dope fiend, you know, boom, I'm arrested. There's violence going on, drugs, everything like that. I'm locked up in the Orange County Jail in uh, Southern California here. And um, I was finally sick and tired of being sick and tired. I, I, everybody I said that I love, my mom, everybody I would burnt. They had to put locks on the doors at home, not from burglars, but from their own number one son. Um, I just... Wow. My life was a mess. My life was a wreck. And uh, I was actually glad to be locked up, strung out like a big dog. I had to kick hair on in the prison and everything like that. But they sent me to prison for a 10-year sentence. Ooh. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm dry out at the Orange County Jail. Then they sent me to Chino State Prison. And when I got to Chino State Prison, I was sober and clean enough to realize, hey, I'm 30 years old now. What am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with my life? And uh, somebody uh, said, hey, why don't you go down to the chapel, you know? They're having a God meeting. And I can remember going to that chapel just like it was yesterday. There was about 50 men went in that chapel room. And some uh, fellow comes in who was a visiting preacher. He comes in, shares a love about Jesus. Then the biggest decision ever made in my life, he says, if you want to give your life to God, stand up. And I'll pray for you. Brother, I did not want to stand up. I wanted to stay undercover. Yeah. I wanted to, can I just do this God between me and you? Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of time with these people. I don't, I never, I don't know any strong Christians, you know. Yeah. Literally, I gave my life, stood up that day, gave my life to God. And um, as we're leaving that chapel, I was hit up by a couple people saying, hey, were you serious with that preacher? Or are you just, you know, just talking smack to Masa? And I said, no, I made that decision and I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. It was an inner boldness that came from God. I didn't have it. I wanted to tell him no way and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But from that day forward, I just got a, a hunger, you know, a thirst that, man, I wanted to be a, a man of God. But I still had an old ways mentality because I always had a group. I had the boys, the crew, the people yeah. together. So in prison, I started a group called God's Gang. Yeah. And so right from the get-go, it was in my blood to be a leader and get a group going. So I had a group called God's Gang. And we were still, you know, buttoning up to the top, wearing our band down, down half over our eyes, and looking all gangster because we were brand new Christians. We were rough around, just like in the Bible, them Peter and all those that hung out with Jesus, yeah. they were badass. Yeah. You know, they're knocking, cutting off ears, you know. Yeah. They were ready to fight, all that stuff. So that's, I had a real rough beginning, yeah. you know. Because that's my old school ways, you know. That's mm -hmm. how I used to live. So it wasn't easy just changing overnight. But uh, I was serious business. I did so well, you know, on serving God while I was locked up that they let me out two years later. Wow. And then two years later, I come out and hit the streets. And the same girl that I burnt for all that stuff, stole everything from, stuff like that, she saw the change in me and married me. Wow. So here now, I mean, I'm getting blessed. I got this beautiful woman in my life, man. We started having kids. And I got a good job as soon as I got out in Anaheim. I got a job for the city of Anaheim. Nice. But then I felt something inside saying, man, you need to help people like yourself. I read the thing where it said, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men. Mm -hmm. And I go, wow, man, you know, I'm going to be fishing for men. And I, I realized that I don't really fish, though, for the tuna or the marlin or the fancy. I fish for carp. Yeah. You know, when's the last time you were invited out for a carp dinner? Yeah. Nobody invites anybody. We're bottom feeders. So I found out my people are the addicts, the gang members, the bikers, the misfits, those that everybody knows. Look at those sinners. 
I think that what you do is more important than a lot of people understand. Everybody tries to like Bible thump to people that come from where we come from and they come off in a way where they can't relate. And I believe God made you go through all the all the stuff that you went yeah. through because this is your purpose. God was watching over you the whole time. You were in Chino, like you could have got killed at any moment, you know what I mean? But you were always protected, but we don't know that we're protected, but we really are. And I think what you're doing, I look at you like a modern Templar. You established that believing in God isn't something that's corny or like, you know, or you have to be buttoned up or whatever. Like you could, anybody is, is accepted by God. And I just, I appreciate what you do, it's special, well, you know? I, I appreciate yeah. that. And so here I am, I get out. What am I gonna do? I got a good job, but that wasn't fulfilling enough. Because everywhere I go, I see my kind of people. So I started taking people in my own home. Before you know it, I got a couple of kids, but I got 30 people living in my own home. And so that was just what I was doing. I was feeding people, helping people, loving it too, you know? I yeah. wanted, to, that was my thing. And these kind of people, and loving them right where they're at. Not waiting for them to get a certain way or when they clean up their act, but taking them just like they are, strung out, hung out, everything. And uh, I, I started taking them to a friend of mine's church. And at the church, they go, can you not bring so many people with problems in? Wow. And because uh, they'd see girls I bring them with their asses hanging out, their boobs hanging out, you know, high, drunk, you know, all that stuff, no money. And uh, I go, what are you talking about? It's whosoever Jesus said. So they go, you need to start your own church. So in 1982, you know, just a few years out from prison, and I am telling you, I started set free ministries and just a street little church and then the next thing you know like it says people are coming and uh we're doing music we're reaching out we're working out with the gang people you know we're working out with the drug addicts you know and it's all for free we're not doing it for money anything like that just loving they're just something about loving people where they're at and whosoever will may come and being a servant and realize what a joy it is you know serving god but at the same time you know, my biker instincts came out of me. So I had some of our guys, you know, say, hey, can we start a little biker ministry? So I had a guy named Biker James and a brother Billy of mine. So we started Christ Sons Motorcycle Club. Yeah. Well, man, one of the first Christian motorcycle clubs on the planet. Nowadays, it's popular to start little groups like that. Yeah. But we started the Christ Sons. And, uh, and like, you got to meet some of the guys. There's, it's still going, but the seed that was planted then is still, if it's of God, it'll keep on going and nobody can yeah. stop it. So here I started Christ's Motorcycle Club and I had all the bikers be my ushers, my deacons. So people would come to church and they would start telling other people where they go, hey, these bikers, they're, they're different people because people still look at bikers going down the street and think all these things that they're out raping and robbing and doing all this drugs and violence. So I had all the, it, was, it wasn't a ploy, it wasn't a plot or a plan. People loved it. They go, hey, I'm going to bring you to church for this bike or I'll hug you. You know, you get to smell leather, man. They all got leather. <laughs> and, and, and people really loved that. This was in yeah. the 80s. It was very cool. Like I said, people, and pretty soon we started attracting guys who would come to church from the Vagos Motorcycle Club, you know, from the Mongols Motorcycle Club, you know, from the Messengers. All these different clubs would start coming. Because people are all looking for God, you know? You yeah. get them there, they're just looking for a place where they won't be judged. So often the church will say, come as you are, and I take the hat off though, uh, or no drinking coffee, or some kind of rule that puts it down, but they started coming in, they started coming in. And then uh, we started working with the, with the gang members. We started working, and before you know it, like I says, the place just started blowing up with yeah. people, and that's where you know, I met guys like Terry the Tramp, you know. He started coming, bringing a whole group of guys from his thing. And kind of made people over the years, and the biker ministry grew. Then we started a club called the Servants for Christ. That grew to over a, a hundred and some guys in that club. It's just God was blessing whatever we were doing. So how was that? Because, you know, like, a lot of the <coughs> bigger clubs, when you expand, they have problems with that. Since you were so tied in because of the set free how rough was it you know first coming out with all these people in a new club because you talk about it like it's a regular thing but there's clubs that try to start every day that get shut down so how was that process well 
remember, I'm, I'm a new creation. God's still working on me. I'm still a work in progress. I was never a guy to ask permission for anything. So I just did everything and asked for forgiveness later. <laughs> and I'm not advising people to do that because there's a, a payment in all that. And so me, I'm just doing it thinking everything's cool. But I can remember being at a run up in Tulare, California, and some of the other outlaw bikers coming to me. And I'm walking with about 50 of my guys. And they're letting me know protocol. You don't walk with 50 guys together. That shows like a power move. I just never was one for the rules. Yeah. If you tell me don't touch, I'm touching. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I remember hearing the Bible verse, can a man take fire into his bosom and not get burnt? And my first thought was, how burnt will I get? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, God was still working on my pride. You know, I wasn't, ain't nobody going to ask permission, you know, yeah. there was no coalition back in the day yeah. that I ever heard of. Yeah. And then when I heard there was a coalition, it didn't mean I was going to go to those meetings. I was just one of those rebels, you know, doing that. So yeah, I had people coming up to me, they'll go, hey, you can't be walking with that many. I had to learn a lot of those things. So I started, be, I've always behaved myself just enough. Yeah, yeah. Pushing the envelope though, right to the edge. Yeah. Once again, like I said, I don't give that as advice to people. Because there's a payment to everything. Yeah, you got to be yeah. built like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. You better believe it, like I said, yeah. and you got to deal with it. And later on, so Christ Sons just grew to be a big old group. Right now, we have Christ Sons in other states, other countries. Uh, you know, uh, the, the biker group, you know, Servants for Christ, growing. Uh, it's, all, it's always been growth, growth, growth. You know? What does it feel like to, like, start something and then see it like in other countries or around the world and stuff like that. Oh, it's crazy. We have some New Zealand people that are just awesome. Whole crew got some people from Australia, Go Coast Australia. Wow. We got a little ministry started in Israel, Bethlehem, Israel. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a lot of people, like I'm the kind of like the mother chapter, you know? Yeah, I, I, yeah. It was the beginning. And a lot of people think the mother is a hoe. Me, you know? And I go, hey, even if your mother's a hoe, you gotta love her, you know? <laughs> Because I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made a lot of mistakes. And man, I get, my last book that I wrote is called How to Build an Empire and How to Burn One Down. And I tell people I'm better at the latter. I got to read that. Yeah, I'll yeah. give it to you, brother. Yeah. How to Burn One Down. Because I've learned, I, I teach people a wise person learns from the mistakes, but a wiser one learns from the mistakes of others. I'm not the wiser one. I got to learn by experience myself. Yeah. You can tell me all about it. No, I'm going to find out myself. So I was pushing the envelope right when I started off the first club, Christ Sons, because back in those days, in the 80s, when I started out, brother, we put on leather, leather vests. Nobody, brother, was allowed in the biker world, except for one club, to wear a leather vest. It was wow. Levi cuts, little rules like that. But I didn't do it to go against anybody. I just didn't ask anybody's permission to wear what I want to wear. I find out later, like I said, in the service of Christ, I found out, you know, you couldn't power trip and go with that many people because, man, we'd be riding out, I mean, over a hundred, you know, bikes in a line, you know, pulling in places and stuff like that. Yeah. And then there was Jewish temples that got uh, graffitied all over by some white power youngsters. Wow. And the Christ Sons group from back in the 80s, we rode over this, surrounded the temple and said, come on, anybody want to mess with them now? You know, wow. you grow when you learn yeah. better ways to communicate and deal with things. But I was rough around the edges. And then I had some mellower times in my life. And so back then, so here we are, the church blowing up a lot of people or helping out. We started a place called the Dream Center in LA, yeah. which is a big inner city uh, project right off the Hollywood freeway. And it's always been taking people in to live, giving them food, sharing the love of Jesus, right where they're at. But the biker world part of it's just always been the core. In the 2000s is when a um, group of the fellas go, hey, let's get a, let's, let's make an elite crew, like a Navy SEALs, you know, like a Rangers, you know, just kind of a, so we, that's when we started Set Free Soldiers. And Set Free Soldiers, just an elite crew. We still had servants, still had Christ's sons, people doing things like that, but the soldiers was, my version of uh, just tighter than ever crew. Yeah, yeah. And uh, doing good, still leading people to cry, still taking in the drug addicts, helping them get off of drugs, helping people doing all that stuff. 
but we became a little bit, what do you call it, uh, where, you know, you just, you, you just really think you're it, you know, you... Road to hell paid with good intentions? Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> Road to hell paid with good intentions. Yeah. We, we meant it all good, yeah. but man, this was around 2007, out here in California. I don't know how it was in the East Coast, but uh, the market, housing market, all that stuff was powerful yeah. before the crash happened. Mm -hmm. Well, in our local chapter here of Set Free Soldiers in Orange County, it wasn't a large group because I made it difficult to get into that group. But the hype is always bigger than the real thing. Yeah, yeah. If you know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with that, yeah. You know, and so this was during the days of MySpace. I remember. So we got our music and we're posted up. You know, Espinosa did all of our cuts, you yeah. know, and I mean, our cuts are looking, and in my mind, they're looking better than anybody's. Our yeah. bikes, the Sons of Anarchy copied our bikes. Wow. We had all FX models, Dyna models. Our, the only club in the world, our bikes, all black. You had the show before Sons of Anarchy, right? We had one that we just getting ready to go. It's called uh, Saint or Sinner. Yeah, yeah. A and E is going to give us Dog the Bounty Hunter spot because he'd lost it because of opening his mouth about saying some negative things. Oh, okay. And so we we were all ready, man. I mean, they gave us four hundred fifty thousand dollars to do our pilot and everything like that. A and E, we were ready. Saint or Sinner, you know. There's still some little shots of you know what it was. It was a bunch of bikers helping, counseling people like that. We've yeah. got it going on. But this was before Sons of Anarchy had come out. Yeah. So the police departments all over who take their weekend courses and how to deal with bikers, you know, are thinking our set free soldier group must be like the Sons of Anarchy, mm. you know? But that show hadn't even come out yet. Yeah. But we were just novel to people. And here I am right here, I got city halls right down the street, the United Police Station's right down the street, so they pass by my place all the time. And they would pass by and I'd have 14, 16 Harleys in front of my house every day. I've had, in my chapter, I had some guys who had some good money, legal money. Yeah. They, were in the, they were in the you know mortgage business, making big money. Yeah. So out here in front, Bentley, new Mercedes, I had a G-Wagon. I mean, this was back in 2008. I mean, you know. Yeah, when the this, whole market crashed and you guys yeah, were doing good. Yeah, it, we're, so right before it crashed, we're rolling. In my, my little chapter of, uh, you know, uh, small amount of guys, you know, a good number of them were making great money. So, you know, when you're blessed, you're blessed. The Apostle Paul put it this way, you know. You know, when times are lean, you know, enjoy those times. But times there's abundance, enjoy those times. Yeah. And so we were, man, we were blessed, but you passed by here, and then we, uh, and then I have a house next door, and we lease three other houses in this block. So we got five houses in this block, we got all these cars, we got all this, we got, we're on MySpace, posted up looking all gangster. <laughs> and so it's looking shady. Yeah. It is looking shady. And when I look back, I go, oh, no wonder they wondered about us. You know, have yeah. you ever seen something and it just, yeah. You know, but waddles like a duck. It just might be a duck. Yeah. So we, so I, and I'm the leader. Everything rises and falls on leadership. So I'm the one that led us into this place where I allowed the my space to be posted up, and that's social media everywhere. Yeah. And then when people come by right downtown here, and they're seeing all these cool bikes and cars, and go, oh man, man, what are those guys doing? And then they're bikers. And this, like I said, before Sons of Anarchy, so they're thinking, this is, oh, these guys are doing drugs, they sell this, they got prostitution. They're thinking all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, this place, I've got a cool looking now, but before I had posted up with soldier heads everywhere. Every, oh, yeah. oh brother, I'm telling you, it looked like a, like a army camp, you know, of, uh, of soldiers, you know, yeah. I mean, it was ready and uh, we were set free, you know, and uh, yeah. we were tooting our own horn, you know, and like you heard me share before, pride goes before the fall. So we're rolling, we're doing good, we're looking good, we're loving God, yeah. but uh, we're riding the streets like we own them, yeah. you know, and then people started talking about us. That's what happens when you see somebody sees somebody, who do they think they are? Yeah. You get the lovers. You get the haters, get people wanting to hop on board and boy, join a part of our crew. And we got people go watch out for those guys. They yeah. gotta be it, they must be up to something. And then uh, 
And then uh, I top it off, start another new church, and the only ones that are allowed to come to this church are soldiers and their friends. Oh, so man. now I'm, what do I think I'm doing? Yeah. I, I look at it now and I go, you know, like some elite place, everything that I was against, yeah. I'm doing. I don't know if you've ever done that in your life, but yeah, you, know, you get a little power and then, you know, yeah. what is it? Absolute power corrupts, corrupts. absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. you know, and, and, and like I said, it, it can happen. You can get drunk on success, you yeah. know, and do stupid things. So here I was making some bad choices and then to top it off, what do I decide to do? I've got a bunch of grown sons. And they all ride in the club with me. And so then my, one of my sons, uh, you know, wanted to, hey, let's start a club where we can have bands and do all this stuff. So Pastor Phil, AKA the Chief, Dr. Phil, whatever you want to call me, at this time, here I am in 2007, and I decide now I'm gonna buy a nightclub. Oh, wow. Not a smart idea, my brother. Yeah. Not a smart idea. What's a pastor? What's a church doing a nightclub? And then, come on, what biker crew in this world wouldn't want to have their own nightclub? You know what, though? I understand you because I feel like you were trying to still live a normal life and, and do your thing and not be buttoned up, but still bring people to God. So I, I, I understand what you were doing. It didn't line up with what traditionally is done, though. There, you know? Yeah, and you're yeah. absolutely right. It, traditionally, I was going outside of the box, but my intentions, once again, yeah. my intentions were good. I wanted to bring everybody together and um, man, but I was making one bad choice after another when it when it came in to uh, that type of thing because I was getting people jealous. I was getting hey hey, what kind of Christian is he? What kind of pastor is he? Boom boom boom. So, uh, but uh, we we're reaching people, and we till this day. I mean, I got like I said, I got a text last night. Hey man, can we open up a you know a soldiers over here? Can we? I mean, can we open up a, a service for Christ over here? You know, yeah. I mean. There's people that want to hop on. People want to belong to something. Mm -hmm. And they want to belong to something good. So my intentions were great. We were building up. We were reaching people. You know, we got a, we started a big old Montana group over there. And we got a, we got a campground at Sturgis with our set wow. free crew over there. So like you said before, it's beautiful to see these seeds, how they've grown yeah. now. And uh, this last week I was honored uh, with a Doctor of Divinity degree from uh, California State University. So here, you know, great things happen, but there's a cost on the bad choices. Yeah. And like I said, some of the bad choices, uh, you know, have made it to where I get wake up calls in life, learning lessons. So here we are, 2008, got our club going, this going, everything's going good. I think everything, life's going good. And then uh, that uh, one day we're out on a Sunday beach ride and we end up, uh, you know, in Newport Beach. And uh, a sad day for me because, you know, life's good, fun in the sun, everything like that. Bills are paid. You know, people coming to Christ. We're a little radical, a little this and that, like I says. But uh, uh, people at first, when they asked me what happened that day, I use a lame old line. I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. But I've corrected that because I knew I was going to the wrong place. There were bells that went off in my head. You know, do not enter signs in front of my eyelids. Wow. You know, uh, hey stupid, turn around, you know. Yeah. Just certain type place. I used to tell people, like I says, uh, man, every time I go to the bars, I end up behind bars. And then I tell people, I go, man, what should I do? And they go, oh, don't go to bars. <laughs> And I go, no, no, there's got to be another answer. That ain't going to work. You know what I mean? You know, that ain't going to work. And so here I am, you know, pushing the envelope a little bit too much, pushing a little bit too much. And uh, we got a show coming up, A&E, man. We're going to be on national TV. It's going to have the, the set free fellows, you know, counseling people, set Biker style, you yeah. know, loving people, you know, just showing people the love of Christ, and everything good, all the intentions great. But like I said, we pull into a bar. Remember, I'm that guy. Every time I go to bars, end up behind bars. But I'm that guy, you know, go in there. 
and uh, we get ourselves in a situation and it isn't about uh, blaming anybody or anything like I says I take full responsibility man no need I didn't need to go there that day yeah you know it's just one of those things when somebody tells me hey don't do this man I don't care how much Jesus I got in me I'm that guy that you want to know why yeah Tell me why. I yeah. mean, you know, what are you talking about? And I want yeah. to find out why. And I yeah. found out that day, <laughs> brother, next thing you know, and, uh, they let us go that day, the police. And uh, I had some of my youngsters that were with me. I says, hey, guys, you know, they're all excited. They said some victory party. I go, there's nothing victorious. This is just round one. Yeah. You know, uh, it's just not a good thing. Yeah. Not a good thing happened. And... Uh, the way the law works is they got a hold of a judge to say, we think these set free soldiers are up to some stuff. We think that they're, and there's an unnamed informant that always comes into play. Yeah. So they allegedly had an unnamed informant said that uh, Pastor Phil's selling drugs, running a prostitution rings, and he's got a whole cache of weapons. Wow. And if you try to go to his, house, the compound, of course, my house got to be compound, it can't be a house, my compound, they'll fight you off. That was the word in the police departments. Yeah. So a week and a half after our little rumble that we had, um, five in the morning, flash grenades go off at this door. And uh, Immediately I heard that, I got on my phone because we were all tuned in, my set free soldiers. Yeah. You know, hey, what's going on? Nobody answered their phones. Little did I know that they'd already arrested all of them. Wow. I was the last house for the arrest. TV news stations here. Man, I'll tell you, they spent a million dollars on that. It was the biggest raid in Orange County history here. Wow. Had 150 SWAT team out there with M16s. They had a tank out here in Anaheim. Had helicopters, dog, ATF, DEA, all of them. And in my mind, I go, what are they here for? You know, little did I, I was so blind to my own stinking thinking. Yeah. Uh, they're here for Pastor Phil Aguilar. Wow. And uh, they came in and uh, and I mean, you know, my grandkids were here, my grandkids next door, everything. They put them all out in the street. My wife was in the paddy wagon. You know, they put handcuffs on her and uh, they had me be the last one to come out of the house. And you know, just guns drawn, just the biggest setup. Like, uh, it's a shame how they treat your families in oh those situations. Oh my God, too. it's it's true. They know the families don't have nothing to do with that. These are these are kids two years old, five years old, eight years old. They're still traumatically yeah. affected by it today. Yeah. And it was uh, 15 years ago. But all that happened, and I was really wondering, I go, what's this going on? And then as soon as they walked me into Aguilar, and like I said, the film news things went worldwide, and uh, the detectives are going, you're gone for life now. You're done forever now. You'll never see daylight again. I mean, just, just going for it, you know? Let me ask you a question. When they said that, did you... Did you have a gut feeling that you would override this? Or like, you know, being here right now talking about it is a miracle, you know, because of what you went through. A lot of times people do a lot of time and they didn't do anything wrong. They got it pinned on them, stuff like that. When you were going through that, did you feel God's presence? Like, did you get that gut feeling like I'm gonna get through this? Or did you not know and you felt like I might never come home again? I didn't have that feeling that you're talking about until I was in the county jail. So here I was, like I said, as they're saying that, are all I'm thinking about, and I've seen my grandkids crying, everybody, I'm seeing all the trauma, my wife there, I'm going home. You know, because I, I've always taught, and I believe, everything rises and falls on leadership. Yeah. So I, it's, whatever happened, it's my responsibility. And so, boom, we get there. So I still don't know what I'm being busted for. Mm -hmm. So, get down to Anaheim Police Department, and I see nine of my other writers there, you know, and uh, then they ship us out to the Orange County Jail over there, and uh, they give me a sign the paper that I'm there on a million dollar bail, yeah, attempted murder, gang terrorism, street this, you know, all the mm -hmm. things that go along with that, and I go, oh, are you kidding me? And uh, 
and we are in what they call the loop in Orange County. We're all in a cell there. And, uh, you know, the, the sheriffs, everything, they got video things all over the place. So they were playing all over. You know, we were doing social media a long time ago. Yeah. So they were showing all the set free soldier videos and laughing and everything like that. Just uh, making kind of a mockery out of the whole thing. And um, then I had one of the head detectives, the jail detectives, came up to me in our jail cell and goes, hey, did you tell those guys before you killed them about uh, Jesus? Wow. Because you guys have led a lot of my friends to the Lord. But did you, before you killed that guy in the bar, did you tell them about Jesus? And I didn't even know what he was talking about. Didn't even know what he was talking about. And... Uh, that's why I'm saying there's different things that are said that just aren't true. And so rumors... So did someone actually die in that bar? No, not at all. I've been wanting to sit down with you for so long, and I went through a similar experience. I had an attempt murder case, and when I went to Central Booking, they told me the same thing, that the dude died. And then when I get in the courtroom, they're like, no, he, it's an attempt murder, it's not a murder. So we both went through a similar situation. Oh, it's, so it's terrible. Like, it's a terrible yeah. feeling, you know, because me, yeah. I'm in there... Oh, it just getting worse and worse. Yeah. So I'm in my cell there, and I looked at my group of about nine guys with me. And the sad part is, is a couple of them were my sons. Yeah. So, man, talk about a broken heart, broken spirit. I go, and I looked at them, and I, my, my head guy, and I said, I let us into this, and I'm going to lead us out. I knew, just like that question you asked a couple minutes, yeah. I knew then God was with me. I knew that we didn't, do what they're saying. That's us, un, you know, this unnamed informant's a liar, and everything like that. And I knew it was going to be all right, but I had to take full responsibility. Just like the addicts I work with every day, I help people get off of drugs and alcohol all the time. But they got to come to admit that they got a problem first. Yeah. And that's where God got my attention in that cell. I was like Jonah in the whale's belly. I was three days over there, like I says, you know, and going, okay, God, I get it. I need to own up to my Do you think shit. they feared you getting too big because your message was too strong and that's why they really acted on you? Two sides, yeah. There's, it's a double-edged yeah. sword, yeah. I, there, there's a whole... The Anaheim police chief at that time, like I said, I can remember him going, you are affecting so many people. What if you decide to go the other way? So there was... They admitted it, yeah. The, yeah, they admitted that. And then this unnamed informant, and then this one detective that just had it out for me. Fifteen years later, they're doing an interview with him right now, and he is, he says, I, I still believe that he got away with a Teflon Don. That's what he is, you know. Some people can just have that in for you. Mm -hmm. And so when that um, was there and they went to court, lowered the bail, I got out, and I fought that case for the next two years. And... Um, you know, I ended up with a probation. But that wake-up call, what happened to me there in the courtroom, assuming full responsibility and saying, hey, God, man, when we work with addicts, we tell them the only thing you got to do is change your life. You got to change everything. Mm -hmm. Get rid of your stinking thinking. Get a checkup from the neck up. You know, you got <laughs> to, as a man think is so easy, you got to become a new person again. So here I am. I'm a pastor. I'm a leader, all that kind of stuff. But pride got in there. I went down for the count. Now it was time to get, you know, renewed. So that three days in the county jail was the best thing that ever happened to me. And the day I got out of there, this house, they tore it up. They dug up the lawns, everything, looking for weed, looking for dope, looking for drugs, looking for guns. You know, I mean, you name it, they were trying to, they tore up all of our places, but there was nothing there. Wow. Nothing there. And... Uh, but on my dresser, in my bedroom, I have a little boss there that when I get home, put coins in there, whatever, change, you know, anything I got in there. I had it for years on my dresser. I happened to at one time put a bullet in there. Uh, Ex-con, it's a grade A felony to have what they call ammunition. Even though it was one bullet, they could still mess with me on that, so they gave me a probation. And as soon as I got released, they gave me probation. I turned this house into a detox center. 
got a state license by the state of California, is a legal place mm -hmm. where the cops couldn't even come in anymore because I use it as a detox house, just like somebody like a cancer center yeah. or anything else like yeah. that. But the same, and I did that while I was on probation. Wow. While I was on probation, I was doing all this. So just turn everything else around. And, uh, and then I just had to realize that, you know, I've been having fun in life, but like I says, from the outside, it did look, you know, yeah. you know, a little scandalous at times. It did look like, where, where did they get their money or where did they get this? Yeah. But these last 15 years have been the best years of my life. And uh, just helping start churches, you know, helping start ministries, helping people out. This place that we're sitting right here, like I said, every night of the week, there's meetings going on here, Bible studies going on here. This weekend we were doing baptisms here. Christ's sons comes over here, you know, when they're having new members come in their club. We're praying for people. I mean, this is God's house all the way. Yeah. But sometimes in our life, there are little seasons where, you know, it's looking like a little bit more like a dog house than God's house. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, I had to own up to that. But uh, we're, you know, we're back on a roll. Uh, we're having a meeting this weekend with the Christ Sons, and we're talking about we want to try to get all the Christian clubs together, all working together. Yeah. Because there's even, you know, in their own camp, yeah. people that are jealous or this or that type of stuff. So, uh, you know, Jesus put it real clear. You'll know they're Christians by the love they have one for another. So, uh, man, you know, I still do outlaw funerals or whatever it is. And uh, I got a new bike being built for me right now by one of my yeah. soldiers, you know. And uh, What are you so, looking to get? It's going to be a little custom special, but FX model, you know, Dyna model, you know. Uh, yeah. And now I'm a little older. He's going to put a little sound system on the front for me so yeah. I can pull in like some of these uh, grandfathers with music going, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, it's just uh, this, uh, this biker world, uh, you know, I told when we took the Christ Sons over there to get in the coalition. Now I'm like, now I'm, you know, I work along with people. Yeah. I work along with them. Before, you know, it was always a cool thing to just, eh. You know, that type of thing. But uh, now loving people right where they're at, doesn't matter, uh, you know, what club they're in, you know, who they are. Because I know everybody needs help. Yeah. You know, so uh, people give me a buzz all the time. I had, you know, a birthday party a couple of weeks ago, and I had other outlaw guys come in, you know, shot callers, people that come in over there. But they know my life's just 110% about Jesus. Yeah. And uh, But anybody can pull up. These are all neutral grounds, good places, and uh, they need me to help them do a wedding, counseling their kid, you know, helping them put them on our detox. I'm there for them. So let me ask you a question. You've gotten a lot of help from God. Is that the reason why you just told me? I got to see ID first, though. But you said that you're 75, but you look young as hell. Yeah. So yeah. did you... What's the secret? Tell us the secret. <laughs> Don't hold it back. <laughs> you know, I, I'm one of those people I can remember when I was in my 20s and we, we were taught, don't trust anybody over 30. And then I hit 30, you know? <laughs> and then I remember when I was 39, I was 39 for a lot of years. I yeah. didn't want to claim 40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when I was 59, I stayed there for a lot of years. And, you know, anybody my age now, yeah, I was born September 15th, 1947. Wow. So, brother, uh, b born in beautiful Klanaheim, Anaheim, <laughs> where, I mean, you know, it's just uh, so many uh, things have changed over the years in the biker world, brother. Like I said, remember, I've been, you know, in the 60s writing, you know, when the Hessians and the Hells Angels and all these groups were around Orange County over here, when uh, the hangmen, the seekers, I know these clubs from way back, and I've got to party and hang and ride around the United States in Sturgis with with all of them but uh it is a mind blower to me because getting on a bike you know is most of the time when you see me and some of the older guys and we're pulled over by the side of the road talking we're usually talking about our our heart ailments or bad knees or broken backs i mean you know the <laughs> the bodies you know yeah. slowly fall apart but i thank god that uh yeah i just turned 75 years old i can't believe that my wife who remember i rob stole everything for she married me you know, uh, when I was in prison, and we just celebrated 45 years 
of wow. uh, marriage. We got six grown kids. They all love God. We got 23 grandkids. Um, one of them just went to Grand Canyon University, you know, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And um, my friend Head from the Corn Band was able to give a shout out to him at school when he was there wow. last week. And so got to just work with a lot of uh, musicians, people in bands, you know, slipped on. Yeah, you know? I see you with like Dennis Rodman and yeah. all these famous people, Snoop Dogg, like. We get to, we get to work with them in this world, like I says, uh, you know, they're, they're into music and they're into this and they're famous, but all of them make those little late night calls, you know, hey man, can you talk to me about this? Because everybody's going through something, everybody's hurting. There's so much going on that, uh, especially as a biker, it works out cool because it's still a unique group of people. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, I still, when I hear a Harley, it just, how it is, and it sets off my day, looks good, that, that, see yeah. them roll in. And I like to psychologically disarm people. That's why I tell people, hey, when you ride in, people are already a little nervous of you. Yeah. Extend your hand out, you know, yeah. show them that, hey, you know what, it ain't, it ain't about what people say, man. It's just its own community, though. Um, but it's a blessing. It's yeah. a blessing, and like I said, I have, uh, you know, fun talking to, like I said, I had some old school bikers in my birthday a couple of weeks ago, and they come oh, over. Oh, oh, it just passed us, right? Yeah, so I wish I was 15. here for that. I wish I would have known. But, uh, yeah, so we're, we're here on uh, this corner of the world in Anaheim, and uh, just out to love everybody and uh, riding for the Lord. Yeah. And like I said, right now, the my primary... Uh, vehicles to be able to get out to others are my brothers from Christ Sons Motorcycle Club. They're a great group. And then I just met with another guy who's got Servants for Christ going strong, you know, and in other places. And uh, just, uh, it's a beautiful thing to, like I said, seed that was sown. You yeah. see it growing, you know, we reap what we sow. And uh, I just know that uh, one of the biggest challenges for me was to love people right where they're at, and then to forgive anybody, just like Jesus on that cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And uh, that's why a lot of people go, man, you, after that guy talked shit about your this or that, and you still forgive him? Yeah, and it feels good. Man, yeah. I, I ain't mad at nobody. I ain't looking no trouble on that. But, it, you know, it was a fun ride. Yeah. And it's been a fun ride. And, and I'm not done yet, you know. I still got, you know, some love I want to share. I still got... Some biker stories I tell people, uh, you know, it's uh, it's old school. We were all, I can remember kicking our bikes over. All of us had kickstart bikes, you know. We was, yeah. we were embarrassed when somebody saw us with an electric start. So yeah. things happened. None of us wore helmets back in the days. So I see out here in um, Cali that um, a lot of the, not a lot, but I noticed some of the Christian clubs wear diamonds. What, what was that like, putting that on? Was it issues as soon as you did it? Like... Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, it was, you know. And then I got a, a diamond on my neck, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, all those things. Like I said, I do not highly recommend yeah. people do stuff like that because uh, you're just going to uh, poke the bear. Yeah. You know, and uh, and it's I, I consider it usually pride that makes us want to go against the, the rules, you know. Yeah. If somebody feels really strongly, hey, do what you got to do, but just... You know, be ready to accept the repercussions because, yeah, there's certain things in, in realizing, like I said, that motorcycle clubs, you know, way back from the days, just like Sonny Barger, mm -hmm. you know, went home to be with gods on his thing. Like I said, I did Terry the Tramp uh, funeral, you know, after 26 oh, yeah. years of leading the Vagos, did his funeral. And so um, everybody's got a, a time limit yeah. on, on their life. And... Um, yeah, those little things like diamond sacred, land, you know, yeah. putting, you know, uh, uh, a lot of those things are valuable lessons. I mean, if you really want to ride or if you just want trouble, hey, let me tell you, there's some people got their PhDs in drama and violence. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not any fun going to court, you know, all that yeah. kind of stuff, the money that you spend, on, you know, that kind of stuff. It's, no fun, uh, you know, always just thinking you have to be posted up and, you know, guarding yourself. It's, uh, you know, there's a whole freedom into just, hey, loving people. Yeah. That type of thing. So, yeah, no, when we 
put it on, it was, you know, um, you know, 100%, you know, yeah, let's see who we can irritate, you know, <laughs> you know, and I'm going to, eh. so yeah, that type of stuff, but uh, we get, uh, you know, get new guys, we have a group of my guys, you know, when I started a group called End Day Soldiers, they're yeah. out riding around, well, like I says, you make sure you're in it for the right reasons, and, um, you know, because there's rules, there's definitely rules, and, uh, you know, go ahead and break them, but you pay the consequences of them. Yeah. You know, and there's always going to be somebody that says uh, they're unknown. There's an informant. I mean, the police, local Anaheim police, the uh, head detective says, "Man, you had you had to have a guy. There must have been a mole in there that let you know that we were going to raid your house. That's when you got rid of all the weapons and this and stuff." Oh. And when they went, because when they arrest you, they set you up good. One of my guys has a whole legal thing of weapons. You know, they're all legal. They took a picture of his weapons there and made it seem like they were at my house. And, uh, you know, hey, that, there's a few b bad police, you know, that yeah. uh, just try to bring you down, but. Do you still get heat from them now or is it like so long ago that it's like calm they, down? They know and, um, I'm working on a project right now where a buddy of mine has been interviewing some of them. And most of them, hey, time has went by, but some of them, brother, as far as they're concerned, I'm still up to my old shenanigans. Yeah. And I don't know. I think, you know, and some people, that's just the way it is. Yeah. But. Um, it's a shame the way politics is with like, with felons and stuff like that, because I think somebody like you, would be a great person to like stand behind politically, you know what I mean? Oh, like yeah. you literally do stuff that help people. A lot of people just throw money at charity and they you actually touch the people, you know what I mean? So uh, it, I wish it was a world that we live in that was like that where people like you were actually, who have actually faced adversity and been through it all can truly lead, you know what I mean? Well, a lot of the people that they have leading never been through anything, you know? That's great that you say that because the last few weeks we've been helping a lady out named Lori Holloway. She's running for mayor of Anaheim. Oh, yeah? And so my crew, we've been going out and passing out flyers, doing all that stuff because her number one thing is just to help the people that are homeless on the street, but help them in the right way. They need treatment. Yeah. They're, most of them are drug addicts, you know? Mm -hmm. They need help, you know? Taking them off the streets, but they need help with their mental health. Yeah. All that type of stuff, and so that's what we're, we're working on. People might not believe, or they might think we're up to some reason for it. No, we're just we want to see people help yeah. people off the streets. You know, people you know living in a peaceful place where you can walk around your neighborhoods. And so it's a you know it's a it's a big challenge, but hey, what better people to do it than a bunch of bikers for yeah. Jesus? You know. Let me shake some legendary hand real quick, brother. It's an this honor, honor, brother. Honor, true hey. honor. I thank you.